How far the international situation today resembles the 1980s is a very, very tricky question. I think that obviously the international relationships have deteriorated uh, and you've got serious issues around, say, Russian actions in uh, the Ukraine and, uh, and so on, and concerns about other Russian activities, uh, including in this country. Uh, but the international setting in which all this takes place is very different. Uh, the bad blood between the Americans and the Russians is rather a complicated picture because of the attitudes of the US president, but also Russia is a much less important actor in the game now than the Soviet Union was in the 1980s, and the risks of a big nuclear con uh, conflict are, in my view, much smaller. Lastly, um, there is the dimension of China. So I think that we can certainly be concerned about the state of international relations, which quite clearly have deteriorated. The way they've deteriorated and the actors in the game is rather different from the 1980s. There are some somewhat superficial parallels between the situation today and the, the so-called new Cold War that we may or may not uh, find ourselves in and the early 1980s, which was similarly called a, a new Cold War at the time. I think one important distinction uh, has to do with the ideological factor. So the Cold War was many things, but one, thi one aspect of the Cold War uh, was this ide ideological uh, confronta confrontation between two uh, distinctive systems represented by uh, the, the two superpowers. And I think we can see throughout the Cold War that both of these systems um, found supporters on the other side uh, of this ideological divide. And that's something that's really lacking today. We don't see millions of people signing up and calling for a system that resembles Putin's Russia or even the People's Republic of China. Um, in the UK or, or in other NATO countries today. And I think that's a, a crucial distinction between um, today and, uh, and the early 1980s. Now there isn't really, a, well there isn't a big ideological divide, you know, between the United States, the UK and Russia. You know, they, Russia has embraced capitalism and so on, but it's tried to redevelop itself as a global player because of you know, the size of it as a country and an economy and all that sort of thing. So I suppose what one sees today is Russia trying to establish itself in the post-Yeltsin period as a kind of an independent actor, you know, because Yeltsin kind of became suborned to the IMF and all that sort of thing. Um, um, but in trying to do that, it's meeting hostility from the US and the Western Alliance, which has pursued its own agenda of kind of incorporating former Warsaw Pact countries into NATO and then former Soviet republics into NATO and making Russia feel surrounded. Well, of course, the stocks of weapons are all the same. It doesn't matter whether you've got 20,000 or 10,000. You could blow the world up with half a dozen. So it's the, the idea of numbers makes a difference, makes no difference at all. Uh, I think the personalities are rather different. I think you had more intelligent people on the Western side than we have now. Uh, people who aren't thinking uh, straight out of, their, out of their brains without making the, turning their brains on. I mean, I, I, I'm, uh, God bless Mr. Trump, but I'm really quite frightened of what he can do by an impe impetuous act by pressing a button on somebody or other, because he can change his mind like that. So I think the unpredictability is greater. But I think also we now know much more, and we didn't make enough of it at the time, we know much more about the accidents and the misunderstandings which have dogged the whole business. I think it was Robert McNamara, uh, Secretary of State for the United States, who said we were saved not by our good judgment, but only by good luck. And he's dead right. Look at the episodes when somebody by just by chance stopped it happening. Good luck. First of all, I feel much more pessimistic about the situation today than I did. I really thought we could end the Cold War and create a new liberal world order. And, you know, as I said, we failed to challenge neoliberalism. But more importantly, I think one gap in my story is about why the East European regimes gave in so easily. And I think they all wanted to become capitalists.
that the bureaucrats saw their opposite numbers in the West as very rich and they were quite happy to trade their political position for wealth. And that was the beginning of privatization and crony capitalism. And I think those kinds of regimes, as we've seen in the Middle East, are much harder to deal with because they both have economic and political stakes. Certainly there are, are deep echoes of this, uh, some of the recent controversies over nuclear weapons with regard to Korea, with regard to Cold War era, uh, nuclear disarmament treaties, all of those things are a, a kind of throwback to that era. But I think more importantly the sense in which there is real discord, not just between governments and their peoples, the rise of populism, etc., but also actually between governments and how they should react to these pressures is fairly similar. So one of the features of the early 1980s is the way in which this new level of east-west tension produced west-west tension, produced arguments across the Atlantic between allies, as well as producing insults being hurled between the eastern camp and the western camp. Um, and I think in some ways we can see something similar happening today. So we have common challenges, the rise of populism, economic issues, the rise of China and so on. Um, but the ways in which the um, European governments, the British, the Americans are reacting are very divergent and this leads to West-West tension that has been manifested in the sort of ill-tempered meetings of the G8, the difficulties of accommodating Trump, etc.